Welcome to the Hey Legal Quiz with me, Edith Forrest. The aim of this quiz is to provide some light-hearted entertainment during lockdown and beyond. I'll be asking 20 questions of leading Scottish legal figures, questions which give insight to their careers and their lives beyond the law. So let's begin. So I'm joined today by Keith Stewart, QC. Keith, thank you so much for joining us to, to take the quiz. Thanks, Edith. It's, it's going to be great fun, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. Um, so without further ado, we will just get started uh, with the first question, which is, if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? Well, um, I used to think that I might make a decent fist of being an academic. But I think that was more because I had an idea of just drifting around the place in a tweed suit and having glasses of sherry at tutorials. And I don't think I'd really be up to very much. And I don't think I'd fit in very well in the university climate, at least not nowadays. Um, my family and loads of people in my family were in the licensed trade. Uh, Dad was a hotelier. And so given that I've still got members of family who are in the licensed trade, I like to think that if I wasn't at the faculty of advocates I could still perform a socially useful function pulling pints in another kind of bar so that would be my alternative career. Very good so and growing up Keith and when did you first decide to become or, or go down the law route or did you have early desires to do that or did that come later? Well it was much later um, you know growing up you'd you know watch tv you know particularly if you're watching um grown-up type TV with your parents. And I remember watching Paul Dark when it first came out, you know, back in about 1973 or something. And he was, he was getting tried. And I remember sort of, you know, lying in the carpet in the sitting room watching this with mum and dad. And, and he was getting sort of cross-examined aggressively. And I was thinking to myself, why did he say that? Why did he say that? You know, if it was me, I'd have said this and all that. But <laughs> that never translated into any idea about going into law. Mm -hmm. And it was really only um, when I was in my late teens um, and I'd done a degree, but it wasn't a law degree. And it was really as much because I quite fancied the idea of going back to university for a bit right. as anything else. And, and law was the thing that I thought of. Okay. Um, but I don't regret it. No. So it was quite late on that you decided to, to take that route. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Uh, question two is, did you have a nickname at school? And if so, what was it and why were you called it? Yeah, I, I did have a nickname at primary school. I was called Boff. Okay. And, uh, that was a contraction of Boffin because I was thought to be quite clever. Okay. Um, you know, Boffin meaning scientist, technician and things from the Second World War. Right. I think that, that feeds into the next question a bit, but, yeah. uh, but I was at a wee village primary school and you know you tend to have one swatty kid yeah. per year or one swatty kid per three or four years and it turned out I was the swatty kid uh, in the school at that time okay. so I got called Boffin. I didn't have a nickname at secondary school um, but when I was at university down south I got called Hoots because I was Scottish so. Um, Hoots? As in Hoots Monarchai, the new and you know, the sort of things English people think Scots say all the time, but yeah. no one actually really says. Okay, all right. And have either of those stuck with you? Do people that you know from back then still call you those things? I just get, you know, I get, I get Hoots every now and again and WhatsApp threads and, okay. you know, just in conversation and things like that with yeah. some of my friends from down south. All um, right. But, there was, you know, given that there were so few of us at the village primary school anyway, I, I very seldom get called Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as you say, that kind of feeds into question number three, which, which is, were you a swatty type at school? You seem to have answered that. And yeah, I, I was. Um, well, I was, I was very precocious at reading. I learned to read very quickly. And that, I think, can often be mistaken for intelligence. Uh -huh. um, so I did used to read a lot and... You know, you, you got proud of, of showing off. Mm. Um, and so I, I, you know, I did read to try to maintain a lead, as it were, you know, to sort of always be the, the swatty kid, the person who could answer questions and all that. Um, 
not necessarily an attractive personality trait, but there you go. <laughs> oh, dear. Question number uh, four. What was your first job, Keith? Well, as I said, my family are in the licensed trade and dad was a hotelier, so I would go across and help him um, stack shelves and things like that, just tidy the place up and what have you. <clears throat> the first job I got that wasn't working for uh, dad or for members of my family was on a farm. Okay. And I had a job in a farm that grew turf, you know, for show homes and things like that, just big, big flat fields of grass. Mm -hmm. um, and I stood in the back of a, of a tractor with a machine that could cut the turf and roll it up, and I was meant to <clears throat> take the turfs and stack them on pallets, you know, mm -hmm. so you sort of slide the turfs together into pallets of 60 or 68, 64, or whatever. And then the forklift would drop them, and the tractor moved on, and we'd, we'd cut the next lot. Okay. So I lasted for about a month. I was absolutely exhausted. Oh, did you? <laughs> well, you know, I thought I was fit, but, you know, <clears throat> if I was, it wasn't the right kind of fit. <laughs> uh, the tractor would pull away from the pallets that I'd prepared and they'd immediately collapse and the other guys would have to go and fix them up again. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh. And did you kind of continue in your da with your dad uh, then throughout the rest of your kind of adolescence and stuff? Would you help out with the family business or...? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I worked, you know, I, when I was old enough to do it, I worked as a barman. Okay. Um, and, you know, just general helping out and stuff like that. Yeah, all right. Um, question number five, Keith, is how do you define success? Uh, yeah, in our field, I think in these terms, to have the trust of the bench and the respect of our fellow professionals. Okay. And I think that's both those things are worth striving for. I mean, obviously, you know, um, you, you try and, you know, success, you, you often think in terms of what other people have, which you might have in a, in a material sense. And I'm not trying to sound pious, but I think a successful advocate is someone who has those things. And, and someone who has those things should always be trying to maintain them. Yeah. And I think the things that you can have, you, you can get early on in your career, um, the risk is you can also lose them by playing fast and loose or making mistakes and things like that. And we're all prone to do that. But yeah, I think to be trusted by the court, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a good thing to feel that you have, you know, to to hear them address you in a particular way, you know we we you know we don't need to ask this question because you know and they, they might not say that out loud, but um, you know for the court to actually ex, you know when you when you appear, um, hopefully they're not thinking not that utter twat again or something, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to. You know, it it just helps to build the good relationships which between the bench and the bar, mm. that is the faculty and the solicitors branch. Um, good relationships really ought to be at the part of it, at, at the heart of our professional activities. I think, and, and you know, I'd like to do what I can to foster that. Yeah, absolutely, and and something that's a long not necessarily a long time coming but difficult to achieve but very easy to lose as you say with people who who act fast and loose as you put it but um no that's a that's an interesting answer and uh, nice. yeah thank you uh question number six keith is favorite drink right um i had to think about the about this one and i was thinking in terms of that program desert island discs uh -huh. you know, sometimes a load of luxury and I love beer um, particularly you know sort of heavy IPA bitter right. kind of beer a, a, a good pint is a great thing I'm very fond of wine um, without being in any sense a sort of judge or connoisseur of it you know, uh -huh. I can't really distinguish between a you know a 4 99 um, bottle of whatever from a 400 pound bottle of not that I've really had much 400 pound bottles of wine <laughs> Um, but because I can drink it any time of the day, 
I'm going to go with tea on this okay. one. And right. I'm going to take tea with me to the desert island. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, yeah, it's just, I never, yeah, I've never had a bad cup of tea. Right. Unless it's had sour milk in it. <laughs> And is that just your English tea, or have you got a tea preference? Partial to the old Earl Grey. Okay. Um, like a bit of Earl Grey, and and even the sort of, you know, you sometimes at Christmas, you know, Santa puts a, a packet of Christmas tea, and it's got sort of cinnamon and spices and all that kind yeah. of stuff. In it. You give it to me, and I'll drink it. Okay. With with milk, would you take your Earl Grey with milk, or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, again, that's probably considered heathenish in some circles, but, you know, I don't take sugar. I used to take sugar, but, because uh, I was always a, a massive tea drinker at school. Really? And, and then I stopped, you know, as with a lot of things, when you're a, a student and no one's actually filling up the cupboards, um, I just got out of the habit um, <laughs> <laughs> drinking it. And, and it, it tastes funny with sugar now, but yeah. always with me. Okay. Well done. I drink my Earl Grey with milk as well. I don't think there's anything <laughs> to that. <laughs> uh, question seven, Keith. What yep. don't you like about your job? I think I get irritated with things that seem to stand in the way of justice. And I think artificially narrow interpretations of things, badly drafted legislation, unnecessary legislation, um, are things that can irritate me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know that people can sometimes be frustrated about objections being taken to, to lines or to questions and things like that. Um, I sometimes I, I sometimes think that we restrict more stuff than perhaps we ought. Mm. But there's so many different things to be said in it. You know, the, speaking about what lay people think about the process when they look at our job, I'm very conscious of the fact that we strive to exclude from their concern the very things that they think are the, of the most central importance, like. Mm has he done it before sort of thing and you know in the form of previous convictions yeah and but i just overall i have the feeling that a broader picture often helps a jury decide the very very important stuff that we ask them to decide mm. so narrowness and you know the, the badly drafted legislation thing you know I, I think it's, it, again, it can get in the way um, of resolving the real question at issue in a trial process. Um, and I think sometimes, um, you know, there can be a duplication between statute law and common law, which just confuses the jury. Um, and sometimes, you know, statute can seem to have been brought in for purposes other than the addressing a, a direct um, evil which had been identified. Mm -hmm. And I think that seldom helps okay. the judicial process. So that's my answer. That's a very thorough answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, question number eight. Mm -hmm. Which was your most memorable case to date? Um, I, I remember my first appearance at the district court as a trainee. Okay. And, you know, the sheer terror <laughs> the night before and thinking about, you know, how am I possibly ever going to, to get this done. I mean, having been up once to see one of the other trainees do it, and do you know what it's like? Everyone else seems so much more competent, yeah. so much better briefed, so much more confident on their feet. And so that, that was pretty hellish. Um, but I'm going to plump for the first murder trial that I did when I was an AD. Okay. Because, you know, it, again, it was a sort of 
it was one of these things where you, you have to take a, a big deep breath mm-hmm. um, and then you, you get on with it and hopefully you're not doing it um, badly. Um, and But you, you suddenly as it were, see yourself from outside and, and are astonished to find that you're doing a passable impersonation of a grown up. Yeah. You know? Uh, so it was, you know, it was, it was an interesting trial um, mm-hmm. and it was well conducted by the defence. Uh, there was a few interesting points. Well, the other one I was thinking of was the, the, the first ad hoc that I did. Right. Um, which was, uh, it was a, it was a Murov case um but it, it had complexities about it that i was in retrospect i was very surprised they would give to an ad hoc particularly someone like me because i didn't have a criminal practice background <laughs> and then suddenly you know i remember on the sort of at the close of the crown case um counsel made a very compelling no case to answer submission and i was sort of scratching my head desperately and wondering what on earth I was going to do with it. But fortunately we got to four o'clock and I was able to go and hit the library and you know, <laughs> remind myself about all these different things that I'd not yeah. looked at since I was a student. Not, not, you know, not with the kind of um, impetus that you get if you're actually going to be doing it in court. Yeah. Um, all right. <laughs> okay. Three um, kind of landmark cases then at yeah. different stages. Um, yeah. 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 Okay, question number nine. Tell me one thing that would surprise me about you. Right. Um, <clears throat> I played for the Faculty of Advocates football team right. in its uh, first, no, well, it, its first visit to the Lawyers World Cup and in the second and third ones as well. Right. And we, in our first, uh, our opening tie, uh, was against Budapest mm-hmm. and I was sent off the field of play with a straight red card <laughs> inside five minutes <laughs> and afterwards we um, you know discussing it in the bar and you know in the middle of uh, general condemnation from all quarters about how could I have been so stupid to get <laughs> sent off in a match that we went on to lose 9-1 and um, and I, you know, I, the impression that I was given, well, people seem to think that it was a, a strict liability matter. But yeah. my view is that the ref was in the Hungarian's back pocket. They bought that match, and one day I'm going to prove it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Question 10. What traits and others irritate you the most? Right. Um... Intolerance, um, intolerance of different views, uh, especially where accompanied by the sense that holding a particular view is seen as rendering someone morally inferior mm. to others. Um, it seems to be quite prevalent nowadays. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I, I'm not objecting to any view when I say this, to, to, any, to any outlook, but it's the, it's the refusal to see that there's another side mm. to the paper. Yeah. Um, the refusal to accept that there might be good and principled reasons why someone doesn't accept every single thing that you say. Mm. Um, and I suppose, you know, it's, it's feeding into people using social media platforms as a way of denouncing others for all sorts of things. It's, it's a bit sort of frighteningly Maoist. Yeah. And it also seems to be the intolerance of somebody's view, but they themselves are the ones that are being intolerant by yeah, not quite. allowing anyone to hold. If You can have a view as long as it's my view. Otherwise, yeah. I'll condemn yeah. you and I'll call you out for whatever I think you are, but you're not allowed yeah. to criticise me back. Which seems, yeah. you see, a very common theme recently in the last few years. Um, so I can see yeah. why that irks you some. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay. 
Shall we move on or do you want to be more specific? No. No, I, no, I, no. I don't want to get cancelled by somebody. So. <laughs> exactly. You'd be condemned on social media. Um, <laughs> f- question number 11. Your favourite flavour of crisps? Ready sorted every time. Really? It goes with, it goes with everything. Okay. Um, in order to prepare for this interview, I had a bag at lunch and it was terrific. Um, <laughs> I... You get, um, I mean, some of the sort of more more wacky flavours, um, maybe they're just too good. Uh, there used to be a variety of kettle chips uh-huh. called salsa and mesquite flavour. Right. And I could find myself eating an entire, you know, the sort of party size bags. I'm just... Mm, 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 <laughs> that, that. I go through the entire thing. So maybe it was too good. Yeah. Ready sort of gives me the ability to stop. <laughs> okay. And do you... That, that's one question that people generally will start by saying, I don't really eat crisps, but this is my favourite flavour. Are you a crisp fan, Keith? Oh, I like crisps. I like yeah. crisps. Yeah. On a picnic, at lunch, yeah, in the bar. Okay. You remember, we used to go to pubs and things like that. You could yeah. sort of sit there. Back just, the <laughs> yeah, it, helps, it just helps things move along. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm not just drawing, I'm not just being exclusive for crisps, you know, nuts, snacks of any description. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them on. Okay. Um, question twelve is: What book would you recommend everyone should read? Well, I had a, a lot of thought about this, as I have with all the questions, but um, I found it a very difficult one to answer. I mean, I love books, and I love talking to people about books, mm-hmm. but I'm very conscious of the fact that it's difficult to get a, a, a universal pick <clears throat> like that mm-hmm. because. You know, the one friend that you're talking to who never reads novels, what would be the point in recommending a favourite novel? Or <laughs> the other friend you're talking to <coughs> who's not interested in history, why well, talk about history? Yeah. Sorry, excuse me a minute. <coughs> so I ended up <coughs> going back to the desert island scenario. <coughs> and on the, on the desert island, they give you the Bible and Shakespeare plus <coughs> any other book. So I thought... I'd recommend the Bible and Shakespeare, but as the additional book that everyone ought to read, I thought Hume's Commentaries on Crime. Right. So we all read that, you know. I mean, it'll be fine. We'll be far better read and versed in all things. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Probably something in that, you know. Um, <laughs> somebody, somebody gave us their answer that they would go back to the original, um, you know, the origins of, of criminal law, with yeah. it more and, and that's a good place to start and um, sometimes just yeah. strip it right back and go back to basics yeah I, I've always loved reading well maybe loved is pitching it too high but <laughs> I get I get a lot of pleasure out of reading <laughs> <clears throat> some of the decisions by Lord Roger of Ellsferry yeah um, you know which for any excuse you know even dealing with an English point, <clears throat> you know, say, the law of such and such has been um, <clears throat> settled in this area in England and Wales since 1827 with the case of such and such. Then he'll say, this of course comes as no surprise to a Scots lawyer, um, given that as early as, you know, 1738, yeah. the High Court of Justiciary pronounced that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he also seems to go back to sources, you know, you you turn up with some breach of the peace, <coughs> some trifling matter, and then Lord Roger of Ellsbury has you back in the Roman Forum within a page, and then following the point all the way through its development, the common law, it's fascinating. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's <coughs> most of the time, I think, uh, you know, addressing the court, on that kind of basis, would be pompous and an unnecessary distraction and get you absolutely nowhere. But just every now and again, a case comes up like that where you know they really do have to know mm-hmm. stuff like that. I mean, I make no claims as a legal scholar, but um, <laughs> you know when you see it done, it's fascinating. So I can see why other people would would agree that it's great to be able to go back to the yeah, the very original sources, the the oldest sources we have. Absolutely. Okay. Mm. Um, question thirteen. Um, 
Do you have any irrational fears? Well, no, I, I don't. I mean, I, I thought about various things that I'm not particularly good with, and they all seem pretty rational. Yeah. Um, thinking about it, I mean, I've never been great with wasps, um, but you know, it's not because I'm particularly prone to suffer anaphylaxis or anything like that. I just don't like them. But you know, it's not. I mean, they can sting, and it's it's not irrational. You know, I don't have a, a any special fear of rats or anything that would have the word the suffix phobia tacked onto the end. So I don't have any irrational fears. And, mm-hmm. I think even the wasps things, retreating. Um, I had to get rid of a nest um, during lockdown and, and I, I went in and squished it with um, the powder. And I came back the next day, you know, sort of all swathed up in armour and sort of <laughs> turning in case they were buzzing around angrily. And, and it, it was just there all covered in the, the powder and obviously as dead as could be. And I just felt mm. regret. You know. Did you? I could have, if I could have relocated them somewhere, I would have done so. <laughs> oh, but mm, necessary if they're in your house and come yeah. in your house, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Um, question 14. How old are your oldest pair of shoes? Right, I, I have a pair of... <clears throat> wow. These are an Adidas trainer from... <laughs> late, I think late 1980s or early 1990s, <laughs> um, which have lost all their elasticity. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, the, the sole is now just so slidey because <laughs> the, the rubber has hardened and all the rest of it. But <clears throat> I still use them in the garden on a dry day. Um, but I think that's the oldest pair. I think they've got another couple of decades left in them. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Question 15. Who has had the biggest influence on your career in the law? Um, without, for a second, putting to one side the um, advice and training that I got from my devil masters, um, Gil Moravi and the late Jim Riley, um, who gave me a super grounding, and Mungo Bovi helped out in that regard as well, just for a couple of weeks. Uh, the biggest single influence on me in law is Lord Turnbull, okay. who, when he was Home Advocate Deputy, and before I'd done crime to a meaningful extent, uh, encouraged me to apply to go into Crown Office, mm-hmm. um, which ultimately led to me practicing in, in criminal law. Um, and Lord Turnbull was the Home Deputy um, for most of the time, uh, well, for the first couple of years, two or three years anyway, when um, I was an AD, before he went onto the bench, um, mm. was always a great source of assistance um, and advice and was great for stimulating discussion amongst the deputies and, and involving everybody mm-hmm. in the, the work that we were doing. Um, you know, sitting around on office duties and, and fishing things out, asking questions, was always someone to whom you could go for um, advice and comment and an understanding. You know, he wasn't setting a, an impossible standard on mm. on people. Um, he wasn't suggesting that it was a mark of an idiot that they had to ask the question in the first place. He was always <laughs> um, helpful. But it was his um, suggestion to me right. um, that got me moving in the criminal law direction at all. So. Fantastic. And one yeah. you certainly obviously don't regret. No, no, no not at all. Not yeah. at all. Uh, and that, that's why his advice was so pivotal. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Um, question 16, Keith, is your favourite chocolate bar? Right. Um, there used to be a, a Cadbury's bar called Tiffin, which uh, had sort of digestive biscuity bits in it, uh, or rich tea biscuit, biscuity, biscuity bits in it, along with currants or raisins or whatever. But you don't seem to see it very often uh, nowadays. So... Mm-hmm. If you can't find me that, I'm going to go for a fruit and nut. Okay. Um, the, the chocolate with the additional richness of the nuts and fruits. Um, it's one of these things, you know, on a long train journey, cup of tea, bar of fruit and nut, view Happy whizzing past the windows. Oh, good stuff. Um, question 17. 
what's the fanciest event you've ever been to? Um, I think the, the fanciest event would be um, college balls in Oxford. Um, commemoration balls are pretty ritzy. Um, all night affairs, you know, lots to drink, ball gowns, black tie, dinner, breakfast, and then everyone staggering out um, into the into, well into the the morning to get to bed or fall over in the parks or you know try and kick the thing on a bit. Um, <laughs> I mean, they were tremendous fun, mm -hmm. and uh, I really enjoyed that. And it, and it was the it was the you know the sense of occasion which made it the the most um well the fanciest event yeah as the question goes and <clears throat> wow there we are I'm, I'm in there somewhere wow okay so is that taken from a obviously up high somewhere um yeah, we all got all, it's, they used to be called the survivors photographs and everyone who made it from the start through to, you know, the, the, the finishing line at about eight o'clock the next day. Okay. Or people, you know, all they had to do, was, you know, even if they collapsed unconscious somewhere, provided they managed to get up for that, they were all herded out into the, <laughs> into a particular place. And the photographer was up at the front of the college and looked down on that, that group. So that's, those are the survivors, are they? Yeah. Amazing. I mean, it was, you know, it was quite a big draw. We had, you know, our one had, and well, that particular one, we had the, the music was by um, Squeeze, uh, who are still sort of thought of in certain circles, and Imagination, a soul funk act, um, a bit <laughs> disco, uh, who were actually in the charts. So, really? Wow. Goodness. Yeah, but yeah, you know, they're all different stages and different kinds of you know, jazz bands and yeah. dance bands and all that sort of thing as well. And then there's the, the sort of um, music in the tent and bars all over the place and just people wandering around, you know, in their youth, having a good time. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. That's a, a great photograph to have. <laughs> okay, doke. Uh, question 18. Um, is what quirks do you have? Well, I, I don't know about this one because, you know, it's the sort of thing, it's the sort of thing that other people could observe yeah. better than you. I, I'm not aware of anything like, you know, throwing salt over my shoulder if I spill it or anything like that. Um, I mean, you know, is it is it weird sort of likes or dislikes or... Me, I suppose, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. That was the one I struggled with most. Okay. Um, I'm sure I've got loads and loads and loads of irritating habits, um, <laughs> which I'd probably rather not go into. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, you know, it's not like, you know, you, you sometimes get sports people who, you know, always put on a particular boot first mm -hmm. or, go through all these rituals before they start and all that kind of stuff. And I expect quite a lot of advocates have that. You know, there's a particular thing that they like, a little sort of ritual that, that gets them into the way of things. Mm. I've never had anything like that, anything in particular, except the, you know, the, the sort of awful dread of the whole thing starting. It's like <laughs> an, an actor waiting for the curtain up. But, you know, even, even at the start, um, the jury gets balloted and... And you're thinking to yourself, great, okay, don't worry. They're still going to get told to go away for five yeah. minutes and then come back. <laughs> once the time yet. Time. <laughs> you're not there yet. You know, something could still happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then the trial starts and, and you're fine. Yeah. It's just annoying that they, they usually, as from defence point of view, it's, it's annoying I find they bring the best or the, the most important witness in first. You yeah. know, like a, little, a little more time to get into it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You, well, back in the good old days when... The crown would always start with a photographer. Yes. You know, at least you could, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, you could, well, I could, you could play yourself in by asking a few questions. Uh, is that a mini metro at the back behind that telegraph pole and all that sort of thing? It's warm up. Remember, um, <laughs> it's what? 
just just warm up a little first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember um, the late Derek Ogg, and how, how odd it is to say that, but Derek Ogg told me that um, he and I had been in Crown Office at about the same time, and mm-hmm. Derek told me that he'd come out of Crown Office and gone back to defence work. No, sorry, he was, yeah, he was talking about what it was like coming from the defence side and going into Crown Office, I'm sorry. And he was saying, you know, that the, the, the strains are different, but one of, the, one of them is you start off and, you, you know, you put the photographer in and you take him through, um, you know, whatever it is you've got to ask her or whatever it is you've got to ask her. And <clears throat> then you sit down and then the judge says, Miss Forrest, and you say, I've no questions for this witness, my Lord. And he said, so I'm sort of sitting there like this. And the judge goes, advocate deputy, and what? Oh, <laughs> I've got to take the next witness. You know, and, and there's never a break. You know, I've got to take another witness after that, and after that, and after that. It just seems to keep going. Yeah, it's relentless, isn't it? And you do I, I, I <laughs> ad hoc uh, prosecuting and thinking, could somebody else get up and have a shot at this? Because no. I seem to be the only one doing the work. <laughs> That's it. You're sort of looking across at the defence, like, Come on, help me out. Just, can we, can we try and get this through to lunchtime by you asking a few questions? Hmm? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, question, are we at question 19? Um, um, we are. Yeah, best piece of advice. Yeah, we, I think, sorry, we lost track there, but anyway, it was all good. Um, question 19, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, I don't think it was given to me specifically, but when I called, um, there was something which was attributed to Lord Mayfield um, that people often reminded ourselves of, which was this, that four o'clock always comes. Mm -hmm. And just that sense that no matter how badly it's going, there will be a chance to regroup and get your thoughts together and somehow, you know, pick yourself up and, and come back at it the next day. Yeah. Well, of course, unfortunately, in the current climate with some judges, Lord Mayfield's a bit out of date. <laughs> and you'd have to say something like 4.30 always comes, or 5 o'clock always comes, or, or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, good, that's good comforting advice, really, isn't it? Just, yeah. you know, you'll get a break at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Hang yeah. on in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good stuff. Um, question 20, what job would you be terrible at? Anything involving telesales. <laughs> um, I'm rubbish on the phone. Um, <laughs> anything involving admin. Okay. You know, just filing and stuff. You know, I, it's one of these things that I appreciate its importance, but I'm just rubbish at it. Mm. You know, I'm always, you know, I'm saying, oh, I'll file that tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow, I'll, then I forget about it. And then, you know, it just catches up. And But the phone thing, I, I you know, I remember being, I've been phoned as we all have um, by people and it's irritating. And, you know, the, the, the ones that are at least honest, I try not to get angry at. <laughs> You know, I try, or angry is the wrong word. I try not to be irritable towards mm-hmm. because I think, you know, these are guys who are like me, you know, they're just starting off with a, an okay degree in an art subject and, you know, that's what you get. Yeah. That's, how, that's how you get started. I mean, it's, a, it's different. You know, I'm not talking about the sort of people ringing up from supposedly the Microsoft um, help desk or whatever, asking for your bank details. <laughs> you know, so, talking just, about telly sales are legitimate in the sense that they're trying to do yeah. a job. But they're trying to do a job. They're probably getting paid on commission. Mm-hmm. They probably hate making the calls as much as we hate receiving them. Yeah. Um, but it, it calls for tolerance and sympathy, I think. Mm-hmm. And so how, how would you see yourself if you had to do that job? Say there was no alternative and you were, so Keith, you're starting tomorrow. What would your approach be to phoning someone up cold? I just drink more. <laughs> <laughs> and that wouldn't be tea, I take it? No, it'd be some of the other stuff. That I'm, I'm <laughs> I would just, you know, have to 
get some way of disinhibiting myself from talking garbage <laughs> you know, down the phone. You might, say, you might say that's why I, clearly if they've heard my jury speeches, that I must be doing that before I speak to the jury. But, you know. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Okay, question 21. What is, what is the weirdest talent you have? Yeah, again, I, I don't know. Such talents as I have all seem fairly conventional. Um, you know, I, I'd like to say I was particularly good at conkers or something like that, but, you know, I'm not. I'm, you know, um, I mean, I, there's all sorts of stuff I like doing. Um, I mean, I'm quite a good cook, but it's not really a weird talent to have, not nowadays to find, mm-hmm. you know, that people who are not professional chefs can cook and, and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you play any musical instruments? No, I'm not musical at all. No. Um, I was good at art at school. Um, and, you know, I, I like sort of sketching and scribbling and it's something I'd like to do more of. But, yeah. um, but again, it's not an especially weird talent, I don't no. think. No. Um, no, like uh, unicycling or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing like that. No. <laughs> that would add a different dimension to you arriving at court, I think. <laughs> Worth a shot. <laughs> All right, well, we'll come to the last question, which is 22. Yeah. It is, what have you enjoyed most about lockdown? Well, I was going to, we'll see how it comes once you've gone over the recording, but I was going to say peace and quiet, but I, I've got a next door neighbour who's an obsessive about um, keeping his garden maintained. Mm-hmm. And he was out for about four hours this morning with his petrol driven hedge trimmer, you know, cleaning <laughs> off on a mathematical basis. And he was revving it earlier on we were talking, so I hope it doesn't drown you out or me out. I heard it a little, um, but I'm sure it's not. Did you? <laughs> um, he's, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't own the guy, but um, sometimes, you know, just hearing it starting up and, you know, I could trim every hedge between here and Edinburgh in the time it takes him to do his front hedge. Yeah. Um, what I've enjoyed most, I suppose, if I can't say peace and quiet, it's just time, time to observe things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, hedges that I've seen go from bareness to bud to blossom, you know, I've been able to, to look at yeah. um, in some detail all the time. We've got a, we've got a bird nesting outside one of the windows at home. And it's, you know, just creating this nest and I've seen it, from the start, mm-hmm. um, that's been precious. Yeah. Um, things like that. I'm lucky enough to live in a nice part of the world in in a small town, um, so I'm close to the country and close to the beach, and so I've had a chance to to see these things more. I feel very very sympathetic to people who've had a crap lockdown because you know I've really quite enjoyed it. Mm. Um, I've done, you know, I found myself, I've been working still, but, you know, working in that sort of way where you think, right, I've really got to finish this thing today. So you get down, you start looking at it, you think, oh, or, you know, your mind goes, you, you mm. just wonder, you know, you're reading a case and you think, oh, I remember that guy, uh, or I remember this, or, don't I have to refer to this once more? Or if it's not, if it's a case from, I was looking at an English case from 1909, earlier on, mm-hmm. which probably in the normal way of things, I wouldn't have considered, but yeah. I've got a bit of time. And, but instead of just sort of reading it through quickly, like I would, um, if there was any particular degree of urgency, mm-hmm. I'd daydream away and think about, you know, I wonder what the court was like, and I wonder what it had been like practicing in those days. And I, I wonder if, you know, just all sorts of questions, <laughs> all sorts of questions like that. And, you know, the, the mind just disappears off and what doesn't get done. But yeah. so I've not, you know, I've, I've, I've enjoyed the time more, and, um, I suppose. Um, and, but I think we're all getting to the point where we've had enough of kind of enforced leisure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to getting back to work. But, yeah. but just that, you know, that chance to, to do stuff that you would notice mm-hmm. otherwise. You know, I, I noticed all these things, but then, you know, a fortnight goes by before I notice them again. You know, the, mm-hmm. 
the hedge that was bare is suddenly covered in blossom. And but you know, over the course of those two weeks, I've been in Glasgow doing a trial. Yeah, absolutely. So over the last couple of months, I've been able to just look. Yeah, and observe and appreciate. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think time to get back to work, but uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll carry some of these things with us and not be so frantic and blinkered. But, you know, it's, it's difficult, certainly, um, especially when you're doing a trial, whatever you do, it's all really quite all-consuming at times. Isn't Everything, it? yeah. You know, lying in the bath before you go to bed. You, and, you know, it's the good bits are when you, you suddenly think, you know, you see the point, you see the approach, yeah. The way you can frame a particular piece of evidence to the jury to, mm. to best present your case. Um, it's, it's when you're you know, lying in the bathroom on the train home and you think, oh, God, I never asked him that. Yeah. I think can be can be awful, but I mean, that's, that's just life. It's, it is. We're all fallible and it's good to hear someone as experienced as you does that. Um, and yeah. And it all works. It all works itself out in the end, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Everything works out in the end. <laughs> it does. Four o'clock always comes, as Lord Mayfield put it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Keith, thank you so much. You've been such an interesting guest. Um, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. I'm glad you have. Um, and before you go, would you mind nominating somebody else to take the quiz? Yes, um, I would like to nominate Alec Prentice QC, um, my former colleague in Crown Office, um, to come in and um, face an interrogation. Okay. Um, <laughs> hopefully you'll put him through the mill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Keith, so much um, for your time and your really interesting answers. Um, um, <laughs> I'm glad you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm back in Glasgow on Thursday right. um, for a, um, a PH. I, I did one. I, I was in Edinburgh. I'm just looking at my phone because I had, I had a, a photograph. But, you know, right at the start of lockdown, I went in to do this excessively surreal uh, sentencing diet where um, it was actually conducted over three days because the client uh, refused to put on a pair of trousers and participate. Um, although he was, he was actually um, appearing by CCTV link from um, Adiwell. Um, and I think it was just the prison being a bit officious and saying, you know, look, you've got to um, put on a pair of trousers and him saying why should I I'm just sitting there on a screen yeah. I don't have to say anything but you know it, it can take ages for the a decision to be taken in prisons I mean quite properly there are places where a chain of command has to be followed but mm -hmm. but I had about three days out of it and um, it was a curious one but I, I took a picture when I was there because oh yeah, here we go um, but I I took the Personal protective. I, I got a kind of old, um, you know, mask from scuba diving. Not scuba diving. You know, just snorkeling. And wrap my handkerchief around my face and all that. So, um, but you know, happily we didn't have to appear in court like that. And I hope I it won't be that. We weren't appearing like that, Keith. No, no. no. <laughs> and I'm glad to see you put your trousers on today for when you stood up. That would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Keith. Um, and again, I, I hope to see you soon. Um, let's hope the courts get back up and running soon um, so we can all get back to work in some form. Amen to that. Thanks, right. Edith. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hey Legal Quiz. We are releasing more episodes weekly, so please sign up for free to Hey Legal on our website to access our free content, legal updates and more. Plus follow us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and on all podcasting platforms.